So I, I started studying a little bit on, you know, the glory of God. And, you know, I think it's referred to in different meanings and different scenarios throughout Scripture. But I think what we're after here, church, is the Shekinah glory of God. And that's the manifested presence of God. That's when it's tangible, guys. Like, I'm looking for... I'm looking for glitter. I'm looking for brilliance. You know, I'm, I'm looking to hear a voice, like audibly. That's the tangible presence of God. And that's kind of what I want to touch on today. And I've got a lot of scripture. I don't know how far we'll get in this. I'm not really much of a Bible teacher. Usually I'll start, I'll try to start teaching, but it usually goes into preaching mode. So we'll see what happens. Amen. But go, go with me to Second Chronicles, Hallelujah. chapter five. Second Chronicles, chapter five. Isn't God good? I mean, just the way He shows up like that, the way He just did. It's like, man, the hardest thing too is is trying to figure out what are we supposed to do now. But <laughs> He leads us, Amen. Okay, so Second Chronicles, chapter five. Um, I. Th- I think I'm going to start in verse 2. Now, this is when the Ark of the Covenant is being brought back into the sanctuary, back into the temple, okay? And it's under Solomon. It says, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief the chief fathers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem, that they might bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord up from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with the king at the feast, which was in the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the Ark. Then they brought up the Ark, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Also, King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him before the ark were sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted for numbered, not not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to his place into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles of the ark could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary. But they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they had come up out of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions and the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun with their sons and their brethren stood at the east end of the altar clothed in white linen, having cymbals. String instruments, stringed instruments, harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and the instruments of music, and they praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house... The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Come on. Amen. Now, listen, this is what this is what we're after, guys. This is what we're after. We want we want to get this place so erupted with praise and worship that the glory of God hits this place. And we can't even minister. That everybody's just on their face before the altar, before the glory cloud. The Shekinah glory is it's a very heavy presence that will put you on your face. It'll put you on your knees. 
It's when man's ministry ceases. Come on. Come on. Because at this time, see, I ain't got to lay hands on nobody. The glory of God is here. This is where us as ministers, we got to learn how to get out the way. Get out the way and, and let him in. we got to learn how to host his presence, how to host his glory. We've got to learn how to move out of the way. If, if I'm not supposed to preach, then I don't need to preach. If this thing could have carried just a little bit further, I would have just put this thing down and said, you know what, God, you're moving. I want to let you move. The glory of God filling this place. The tangible presence, man. Gosh, I've been praying into this for my whole life. Since I was in my early 20s, man, I've been praying for uh, the tangible presence of God. And I've encountered it at times, you know, through my walk with the Lord. I've encountered through different seasons. It's like, man, sometimes you're really, you feel like you're touching on it. And then other times it feels like, you know, he's not there. But I, I'm believing for a day and a time, Pastor, and I feel like we're, we're, we're just on the, the edge of it and we're looking over and we're anticipating it and there's so much anticipation that, that we're going to see a glory cloud fill this house. A glory cloud over Summit Church, over the land, over the property, even over Sevier County because it's our responsibility to steward this glory, to carry this glory. That's why we come in here and we get touched by it and we get filled with it and we're supposed to go out there and we're supposed to take it to a lost and dying world. Don't hog it to yourself. Come on. There's times when I want to hog it to myself because I don't want to move sometimes. I can get caught up in the presence of God sometimes. I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to go nowhere. I could, get, I could almost get lazy in a sense. It's like, man, I don't want to move. I don't want to have to go deal with nobody. But I know I have a responsibility to be a steward of that glory, to carry that glory, to move with that glory. See, it's not... Guys, when we get into the presence of his glory, it's, all of our agendas have to cease. All of our, our plans have to cease because now you're just, you're moving with him. That's the manifested glory of God. All my thoughts and ideas about what I want to do with ministry and whatever, it doesn't matter, man. When the glory of God hits, it's like you're captivated by it and it will carry you. And we got to learn how to let it carry us. That's why we got to get out of the way. Totally out of the way. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm believing and I'm seeing moves of God in this house where that's going to happen. We won't be able to minister. It said that the priest could not even minister. There's a couple of essentials in here that I think we need to look at. I mean, we could really break this down. And there's probably people that know how to teach a little bit better on this than I do. But I want to give you some of the basics on this of what, what I saw one of the things that was really relevant, it says that the priests had sanctified themselves. I think we get the wrong idea sometimes today that like, oh, Jesus paid it all, brother. You ain't got to do nothing. You have to participate with him. You have to participate with what the Holy Spirit's doing. I have to keep myself set apart. And if, if I'm setting myself apart and we're, we're coming in here as believers and we, we're sanctified, that means we're set apart from the things of the world. My mind and my heart is upon a move of God's glory. It's not upon the football game. It's not upon the things of the world. And it's not that the things of the world are bad. Because listen, I love to watch sports. I'm very, very sports minded. But when it's time to seek God, when it's time to, to do the things of God, then I put these worldly things aside. And I'm sanctifying myself and I'm setting myself apart because I, I desire him more than anything. I desire for a move of his glory more than anything. So it says that the priests had sanctified themselves. And then it says that the Levites, the worshipers, were placed out front where they began to praise and worship. And see, it was really cool how this service went today because I feel like God demonstrated some of this. Remember how we started off, guys, and the worship was just, it was flaring. It was going, man. The praise was going. Like we was in here praising God. And it set the stage for something. 
If we really study out the teaching of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, there was something, a component of that tabernacle, right before you got into what's called the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. And when you study out what that altar of incense is, it's a composite of different ingredients that goes up to God. And I believe it's sacrificed, sacri sacrifices that are made. I believe it's, it's, it's praise and worship. I believe it's people that are not afraid to go through the fire. I believe it's people that have been faithful through the years. Laid down lives. People that have a revelation of the blood of Jesus. Where all self-righteousness is out the window. And all these different ingredients, they begin to form at that altar of incense. And the Bible says that there's a sweet-smelling savor that goes up to the Lord. And he smells that, and his glory is poured out. Guys, we're there. We're there. We are there. The Holy Spirit is moving in such, in such a way in this, in this time, I believe. And we've gone through some things over the past three, few, few years where it was like some intense fires that, that we needed to go through. And, and we were willing to stay in the fire and not jump out and, and be like, no, I'm, I can't do this. You're willing to stay in the fire and you keep praising and worshiping in the midst of the fire. You're on the precedence of God's glory. The spirit of glory rests upon you because of your faithfulness, because of your endurance. Whew, I could feel his anointing right now. I could literally feel the glory of God on my head. I'm believing it's going to make my hair grow back. I've been believing this for years. If you see it start growing, don't be surprised. It's going to happen. Amen. <laughs> Prophesied that boldly, didn't I? The cloud. Now, I've got to talk about the cloud for a minute. Look at, look at verse 13 in that portion of Scripture that we just looked at. Look at verse 13. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thinking and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, his mercy endures forever that the house, of the, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Now see, the, the glory actually dwelt in the midst of the cloud. And the reason why, the cloud had to kind of overshadow it in a sense because flesh can't stand in the glory of God. It will consume the flesh. That's why when Moses said, let me see your face, God said, I can't let you see my face. However, hide over there in the cleft of that rock and I will walk by you and you can catch a glimpse of my backside because no man has ever seen my face. You, it's coming into the direct Shekinah glory of God, it, it's, it can be consuming because it says that our God is a consuming fire. So I believe what God does and I've been crying out, let me see your glory, let me see your glory for years and years and years. And I believe he's protected me. He's protected me from it, but he's guiding me and leading me into it. So there's kind of a cloud, you know, that's around it, and he's giving us bits and pieces of it. And see, what, what's happening now is the cloud is just beginning to dissipate and fade away. And this is prophetic as well, because what happens in the end upon the resurrection is the Bible says that the, the sky recedes back like a scroll, and the glory of God appears. Says that Jesus comes in the clouds. He comes riding on the clouds. And then the sky recedes back, and, and, and then the glory of God appears. In Colossians chapter 3, I believe it starts in verse 1, it says that, that we are hidden with Christ. And in Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall appear with him in glory. We'll appear with him. That glory is that radiance, that brilliance of Jesus. And I believe when it appears, it's going to be so bright that if you're walking in the flesh and the things of the world, it would consume you. But see, the church is being tried and being purified. 
to where it could stand in, in the face of God's glory. You ever try to look at the sun on a, on a real clear day? You look at the sun and it's like it, it almost blinds you. This is kind of a representation of what it means to, to look in the face of glory. But God's glory is so much more brilliant and radiant than the sun. Now, I want to go now to, to Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. It says, the Lord, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord, and they died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with a linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments, therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house so during this phase of, of you know what's taking place here you know they had a religious system set up because Christ had not come yet and the perfect blood of Jesus for a sin sacrifice had not been shed in the earth. So there is a religious system that's set up to get the priests into the presence of God. Now what had happened in the beginning of that portion of scripture is that a couple of Aaron's sons came in there with what they called strange fire and they got consumed and, and they were destroyed. It always takes a blood sacrifice to get into the presence of God. We don't get into the presence of God in our natural humanity without a blood sacrifice. So in this, in this phase of where we were at, they had to have animal sacrifice because, like I said, Jesus had not come yet. Now, the glory of the new covenant is, is that, you know, Christ comes and he sheds his blood for the remission of sin. Back then, it's like when you sinned, you had to bring an animal to a priest. And the animal had to be slaughtered by the priest. And then the priest could, could maybe get into the glory of God on your behalf. And then the priest could come out and he could resolve your sin and, you know, maybe release a, a, a tinge of that glory to you. That was the communication between God and man at the time. The glory of the new covenant is Christ's blood. This is what I really want us to zero in on. Because if we're going to enter into his glory, we're going to have to have a re representation of his blood and we're going to have to have a revelation of his blood. A deep revelation, church. An understanding of what it means. Stop letting the enemy condemn you. Stop letting the enemy tell you that you're not worthy. Am I worthy to stand up here? If I take a look at my past, no way. If I take a look at the things, some of the things that I said yesterday, no. Come on. Not going to tell on myself. I didn't do no crazy type of sin, if that's what you're thinking. I just run my mouth a lot. And it's not good. And, and I have to repent. Because, listen, the attitudes of our heart sometimes, you know, our mouth reflects that and it's like, what, what's really going on inside of my heart? You know, what, what's really in me, man, that would cause me to, to say something like that? And, and I understand the blood of Jesus to a degree that it's like, okay, 
instead of letting the enemy condemn me and say, you're not worthy to stand up there and preach, I'm going to get before God and say, I repent, Lord, and I need you to help me, and I need you to change me. And, and by that power of that blood, I am what I am. Amen? So I want to go to Leviticus uh, chapter 9. Leviticus chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, go to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and the people. Offer the, offer the offering of the people and make atonement for them. As the, as the Lord commanded. So we see here that there's a, there has to be an offering for sin for the glory to be revealed. Now, now go with me to the book of Hebrews. Here's where we're going we're gonna to bring this thing home, all right? Go to Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle was called the holiest of all. Let me stop and pause just for a second there. The holiest of all was where the Shekinah glory dwelt. That's the holy of holies. And it had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. There's so much to this. But the glory sat upon the mercy seat. And the mercy seat, praise God for the mercy seat. Because you and I would be sunk without the mercy seat. Praise God that his glory dwells over the mercy seat. That, that he has mercy upon us. His mercies are, in, are renewed every morning. Let me read on before I get to preaching. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscious. They're concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings, fleshly ordinances impose until the time of reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of of the eternal inheritance. Man, that's packed full of good stuff. That is packed full of so much that we could break down. But I want to really focus on the blood because the, the Old Testament told us that, that we needed blood to get into the glory. I want the glory of God. I want to see his glory. I want to, I want to see him glorified for, for what he did. For what he did for me personally. And I got to keep this thing personal every day. 
every moment of every day, man, I've got to keep this thing personal. I've always got to have my heart inclined toward Jesus and that cross because that cross, man, is what redeemed me. That cross is what freed me. That cross is what brought me to the end of myself when I was selfish and when I continue to be selfish. God, he zeroes me back to the cross. He zeroes me back to the blood. He gives me greater revelation any time that that I'm pressing him to see his glory, to see his glory. You know what he tells me? He says, you need a deeper circumcision of your heart. You need to understand what that cross was really about. You need to understand the death, the burial, the resurrection, the blood that was shed. You're seeking after this. You're seeking after that. But son, you need to come back around to your first love. You need to get with it, boy. Come on. Sometimes he talks to me like that. But that cross, man, that cross is such a powerful element because here's the deal. Jesus is the one that needs to receive the glory. Jesus is the one that that needs to be glorified. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And when he he lifted him up on that cross, something happened. The earth quaked. Something changed. The curse broke. The veil of the temple was was torn in two, and man had access to the divine glory of God. Are we utilizing this? Oh, how serious are we about this? We want to host his presence. We listen. This this glory don't come cheap. It's not going to come cheap and easy because he's not cheap and easy. Oftentimes I've prayed and sought, and I've you guys know the ministry that I do, and 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 I believe with all my heart that, man, if people will have an encounter with God's glory, they're going to get free. They're going to get healed. They don't need medication anymore. They don't need psychiatry. They don't need counseling anymore because they can come right into the presence of God's glory and get everything that they need. I believe that with all my heart and I've sought after God. You know, God, bring the glory, bring the glory. And... I feel like he's, he veils it sometimes because he's saying, son, it's not going to come cheap. I'm not cheap and I'm not easy. I don't sell out like that. You're going to have to pursue me with everything that's in your heart. You're going to have to come after me every day. I want to know that you love me. I don't want you to take this glory and, and just profane it anywhere you want it. I want you to steward it rightfully. I want to give it to you. I want it to shine upon you. I want you to be able to be a carrier of it. I want people to be free. But this is something that you have to go after with everything that's in you. The glory of God. It says the priests set themselves apart. The worshipers stood before God and they praised and worshiped for hours. And they prayed for hours. Because that's what they desired to do. We're too antsy sometimes, guys. We're too, too anxious. We want to get on to other things. Come on. I'm trying to stir a hunger for revival. And, and, and that hunger for revival, listen, you've got to have a firm foundation of the cross. You've got to understand the blood because it's the only thing that's going to get you in. It's the only thing that's going to keep me centered. It's going to keep me grounded. When I see revival breaking out and prophecies are being foretold and healings are happening, I've always got to center back to the cross because that's what brings him glory. It can't be about me laying hands on somebody. It can't be about my ministry. It can't be about my preaching. It needs to be about the glory of Jesus. We need to lift him up. That cross did it all. That cross won it all. That cross did it for us, guys. Come on. That cross and that blood. My goodness. We'll praise him for eternity because of it. And anytime you feel like you're getting stale, anytime you feel like God's not speaking to me, anytime you're feeling that religious spirit, let me encourage you, center your heart back around the cross. Center your heart back to your first love. Remember what he did. (sighs) My goodness, man, I was a sunk ship. I was a sunk ship, I'm telling you. 
I had no right to live. No right to live. I've got no right to stand up here and preach. But he made me worthy by his blood. He made me worthy by that cross. I give him the glory. I give him the glory. I've watched people that I grew up with, man, they're dead. They're dead, all of them. And I stand and I live a life. Man, I live a life that I am not worthy to live, but he made me worthy. Not anything that I could do could ever make me worthy. Well, I've been good for the past 20 years. That doesn't matter. That debt of sin had to be covered. You want to see the glory of God? Do we want to see revival? Church, we've got to stay centered on this message. We've got to stay centered on that cross. We want to see souls saved. We need people to get a revelation of the blood. We need people to get a revelation of of Calvary. Calvary. What took place there? He comes. He comes in the form of a man. He empties himself of, of, of his Godhead, of his deity. And he puts on flesh. And he comes and he pays for the, for the debt of our sin. And the curse that we brought upon ourselves. A loving, loving God. God is nothing but love. Nothing but love. When I get into his presence and I'm feeling his glory, I don't feel nothing but love. I never feel condemnation. I never feel hatred. I never feel fear. I don't feel any of that. I don't feel depression. I sense nothing but an overwhelming love. And when we keep that, guys, when we stay in the vein of that, man, we stay in the vein of his glory. Come on. Pastor Zach, I'm going to ask you to come back for just a little bit, okay? Because I don't want to end this without knowing that we're supposed to end it, okay? And I don't know where it's going. I really don't. But will you stay with us a little bit longer? Just just hang in there, all right? Don't leave. Don't leave because you never know what's going to happen. Things can wait. Sometimes getting into the glory of God will take time. Because it's special. It's for a special people. It's for a special church. It's not going to be cheap and easy, guys. All over this house, I know and I see people, I know a lot of you, and I know you're faithful. You're faithful to come and pray. You're you're faithful to give. You're faithful to this call. And he sees you. He sees you. He's smiling on us. I know that he is. And we're right on the edge of it. I know we've been saying that for a long time. We're right on the edge of it. Let's go in. Let's go into the Holy of Holies. Come on. (laughs) By the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way. Listen, this is the only way you get there is by the blood. You don't earn your way in. You don't pray your way in. Now, we participate in prayer. We participate. We show up. I want to show up in order for him to blow up. Amen. Yeah.